The next talk is, dark, uh, is, doc, is titled Dark Stars by Chris Kavaris. Yeah, uh, good morning. Uh, I would like to thank first uh, the organizers uh, for this uh, nice uh, workshop, especially Lidio and Violeta that I mostly engage with. Uh, it's nice to be back here uh, and also see some old friends uh, from the old times at MIT 20 years ago, like Sanjay. Uh, so I'm going to discuss uh, about uh, um, dark stars, the possibility of uh, dark matter making its own compact objects. And also, uh, since we're talking about stars, I, I will also mention some ideas about uh, neutron stars uh, that were already mentioned by Sanjay and also yesterday by, by Joe. Okay, so, well, there is a lot of evidence uh, uh, that uh, dark matter exists. We know all this. And we also know that uh, um, dark matter, collisionally is called dark matter, actually behaves uh, quite well at uh, uh, large scales. Um, however, uh, if we look at uh, small scales, uh, there are several issues. For example, there is the uh, core cusp uh, problem. Um, you know that uh, uh, simulations uh, predict uh, that uh, the profile of dark matter actually would be uh, a caspy profile. However, observations show that uh, it's a flat uh, potential. Uh, there are also other problems like the diversity problem and the too big to fail. Um, and the resolution of all these issues uh, might be a lot of different things. Might be the effect of baryons. It might be also other stuff. Or it could be uh, the fact that uh, dark matter is not completely collisionless, but uh, it has some uh, self interactions, okay? And uh, one can play a little bit with numbers if you just put some typical numbers, if you just want to have one scattering within the galaxy, uh, you end up uh, with a, a cross section of this uh, value here. Uh, also, to mention that um, um, uh, they can provide actually, well, dark matter self interactions, they can provide the seeds for uh, the supermassive black holes. Uh, there is an issue with the supermassive black holes that we see, for example, at the center of our own galaxy or at the center of other galaxies, because uh, these supermassive black holes, uh, they can get up to 10 to 9 uh, solar masses, and uh, simply there's not enough time to get to this mass uh, by accreting matter within the edge of the universe. So uh, if you start from astrophysical black, hole, black holes. Okay, um, so now, we have uh, self interactions on, on, on one hand. The other uh, ingredient that I'm going to use is uh, asymmetric dark matter. So asymmetric dark matter is an alternative to the usual sort of like WIMP uh, paradigm. And uh, um, the asymmetric dark matter is basically, we have a conserved quantum number, like uh, the baryon number, and uh, we create an asymmetry. There's more particles than antiparticles, okay? The antiparticles just uh, 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 annihilate. And then we're left only with the, excess, uh, the, the excessive uh, amount of particles. And uh, in that case, uh, we have a stable dark matter particle. And this scenario can work either for light dark matter. Uh, for example, you can imagine that uh, you have some Spalleron process early on that locks the number of uh, baryons uh, and the number of dark matter. In that case, you will just need uh, a dark matter particle of the order of like 5 GeV to explain the uh, dark matter abundance, or um, it, it can work also for like uh, heavier dark matter particles because, for example, you can assume that uh, after inflation there is a period where you violate uh, um, uh, the bio number and the dark matter number, and uh, um, you can have some sort of like a exponential suppression uh, like this one here, and, uh, and uh, it turns out that uh, if you just put here like a uh, a temperature of freeze out for spalerons, for example, of uh, 250 GeV, um, and uh, um, a dark matter of the order of TeV, this number here gives you, again, roughly five. Okay, so um, these are the two ingredients, and then if you, we put them together, we can ask the question, okay, can we have dark matter that uh, uh, makes its own compact objects? Um, how do these objects would look like, okay? Um, and um, uh, how they can form in the first place and how we can distinguish them from neutron stars or from black holes or what kind of signals we can 
uh, see in the sky regarding these objects. Of course, since we have not much clue about uh, what uh, dark matter is, uh, as we can imagine, the, uh, uh, the variety of answers here is, uh, is uh, very large. But nevertheless, we can try. So, for example, we can start with uh, asymmetric dark matter and uh, um, fermionic dark matter. So one can, for example, assume that uh, we take some Yukawa uh, self-interaction between uh, fermions, uh, and we can write down uh, an equation of state. So this is the pressure, this is the, the density, this is the part related to, uh, to the uh, Yukawa interaction. This X is basically the, the Fermi momentum over the, over the mass of the particle. So we assume that this is a degenerate Fermi gas. And then using this uh, naive, let's say, um, equation of state, together with the tolman oppenheimer volkov we can solve and we can find basically um, this mass radius uh, relation that Sensei also showed uh, a while ago. So basically all these solutions have a common characteristic. There is a, a family of solutions. There is a maximum mass, something like the Chandra Sekhar mass in the white dwarfs. And then uh, everything to the, to the right are stable solutions. To the left, uh, these are unstable solutions. And um, also, you can notice that, uh, for example, as you move to um, larger masses, um, the, uh, the maximum mass of, the, of this object reduces, okay? Uh, this is because, for example, if we just completely ignore uh, self-interactions uh, for fermions, uh, just the Fermi pressure will give a maximum mass uh, of the order of m Planck cube over m squared, okay? Um, so that's, that's why, for example, for, uh, let's say, uh, uh, 10 GV or something, you get masses similar to uh, or close by to, to, to neutron stars. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> in order to uh, figure out actually the, uh, the, 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 the self-interactions, of course, there, is, uh, there are th different regimes here. There is a regime where uh, it's called the classical limit, where um, this is the mass of the dark matter particle. This is the relative velocity, and this is the mass of the mediator. If you satisfy this relation, then this problem is identical to sort of like uh, the, the plasma physics uh, equivalent problem where M phi is going to be the Debye screening mass. And then people have calculated this in condensed matter physics. Um, while if we go to the other and very interesting regime where the velocity is actually small, uh, one has to solve these uh, better salpeter equations. Um, we have this uh, Sommerfeld uh, enhancement in order to um, uh, figure out uh, I mean the cross-section. So if you do that, then you can uh, f uh, find out uh, uh, what is the uh, combination, let's say, of dark matter mass and uh, mediator mass that you need, you need to be within this band to sort of like be within this bulk of uh, cross-section that could uh, alleviate all these issues of the small-scale uh, structure that I mentioned earlier on. Okay. If you are within this red color here, you're excluded because you just make our galaxy, for example, uh, too spherical, okay, because of self-interactions, and you don't want to have that. Um, and uh, one can also calculate um, the, uh, the so-called Sandra Sekhar mass, like in quotes, of, of, the, in, of these uh, stars. So what is the maximum mass uh, as a function of, uh, of, of the uh, interaction and also the mass of the particle? And of course, as you can see there, depending on what kind of values you choose, uh, there is a lot of different uh, uh, masses that you can get. You can get from very, very uh, large objects uh, to very, very tiny objects, okay? It all depends on, on what is the strength of the interaction and what is the uh, uh, individual mass of the dark matter particle. Okay, um, now the same thing can happen, one can do the same thing also with uh, bosonic stars, okay? So this has been done already in the past by Colby, Sapiro, and Wasserman in this uh, seminal paper in 86. So you can solve basically Einstein's equation together with uh, the, the Klein Gordon equation. Uh, this is for repulsive interactions. For attractive interactions, one can solve the Gross Pitevsky equation together with the Poisson equation. And again, uh, you get something similar. You get uh, the same sort of uh, behavior. There is a maximum mass here. All of these are legitimate solutions. All of this here. Uh, are unstable solutions, okay? Uh, the picture is the same. Of course, the parameters are different. 
Um, and the, the whole point here is that uh, basically if you have a bosonic star, uh, this m Planck cube over, over m squared that I mentioned uh, before as the maximum mass for the uh, uh, fermionic uh, uh, stars reduces and becomes m Planck square over m. This is a much smaller number. And this is simply because uh, bosons do not have Fermi pressure, okay? They can use only the uncertainty in principle to sort of like uh, somehow prevent uh, further collapse. And therefore, their, their size is, uh, sorry, the, 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 uh, the mass is much smaller actually than uh, what it is uh, for, the, uh, for fermions. Okay, so now, um, okay, the question is like how we can distinguish these uh, objects? Well, um, one of these ways to sort of like uh, um, compare what the signal of a merger between two objects like this will be compared to, uh, for example, two black holes of the same mass. Uh, so this was done, for example, by uh, Judith McCall and Urbano a few years ago. And uh, <clears throat> of course, they got something that makes absolute sense to me, at least. Um, you expect that uh, at the beginning, during the spiral, there is no way you can distinguish between the two systems, OK? Uh, they, they just look like point uh, uh, objects. They just uh, rotate around each other, so they look identical. However, uh, because these uh, dark stars, okay, these exotic objects, uh, have a radius which is larger than the sparsity radius of the black holes, okay, uh, they start getting deformed earlier on, while the black hole, you see, it, the signal keeps continue, it, it continues, and then eventually uh, the ring down happens much later than uh, when it happens for, the, for these uh, exotic objects. Now, uh, on top of that one, I uh, can also actually study the deformation of this uh, dark star. So, uh, one can calculate the so-called love numbers. What is this? You just take a star, you just put it uh, in a, uh, in a uh, quantrapole uh, gravitational field, okay? And you see how much you can deform it, okay? This is what it is. You just put uh, the, the magnetic field, uh, the, sorry, the uh, uh, gravitational field here, and you see uh, how uh, the, the quantrapole moment of this object changes. Okay, this lambda is in, encodes this uh, love number here. Um, and these love numbers that we estimated, uh, also with Andrea Maselli, who's, he was here at some point uh, yesterday, um, and the compactness, um, we see that uh, if one takes uh, uh, these uh, dark stars and, and uses the um, self interaction cross-section, which is uh, sufficient to alleviate all these issues of small-scale structure, then the compactness is much smaller than the one of the neutron stars, and also the log numbers are different, okay? So in principle, even if we're un unlucky enough that the dark star has exactly uh, the same mass with the neutron star, or, or falls within the range of a, uh, of a neutron star, let's say, okay, between one and two solar masses, then it would still look different. Um, unless we're very unlucky. Okay, now uh, this is the big question now, how we can form these objects, okay? Because it's, uh, it's nice to study all these properties, but uh, uh, there's an, one important question, which is like uh, how you can form these objects in the first place. Um, so there can be different uh, mechanisms for, for doing that. Um, we studied with uh, uh, with uh, um, Ruben Essig and uh, Gania Ogrinovic, Daniel, um, and a student of, uh, of Ruben, uh, the following model, okay, we, we assume that uh, there's some sort of uh, dark version of, of QED, so there is uh, and a dark electron that uh, couples to a dark photon, and uh, basically uh, the dark matter cloud um, cools by emitting Bremsstrahlung, okay, so by interacting like this way here. You just emit a dark photon here, and by emitting this dark photon, this dark photon escapes from the, from the cloud, and uh, the object uh, loses energy. So what happens? Well, imagine that you have a perturbation that uh, enters the horizon, okay, very early on, and starts growing, okay? At some point, uh, it decouples from the, from the Hubble expansion. It turns around, and, and uh, you start uh, Collapsing, okay. So you can use different models. There's uh, the, the press sector uh, 
model, for example, or other kinds of models to predict like what kind of uh, halo you're going to have. But uh, um, at first, as you collapse, uh, things are going to uh, move adiabatically, okay? So what you see here is, uh, is uh, density as a function of temperature. So um, these uh, parallel lines here represent different genes masses, okay? So initially, um, as this thing collapses, um, it just uh, contracts adiabatically, so it moves uh, towards this direction. So uh, the density increases, but also the temperature increases because it's, it's an adiabatic uh, process. And eventually this will stop uh, up to the point where you simply, the whole cloud actually, um, um, well, uh, the whole cloud becomes equal to the genes mass uh, of your system. So after that, um, the system uh, will very slowly move towards this direction. I mean, uh, during this time, the system cools by emitting this Bremsstrahlung, but uh, uh, these photons are not uh, effective, so, so this process moves very, very slowly. However, as you keep increasing the density, at some point, this process becomes effective, okay? Because uh, the, uh, the whole process is uh, proportional to n squared, the number density squared. So at some point, um, the, uh, the cooling time scale is going to become equal to the free fall time scale. And from that, things are going to move very fast. So you move along this line, which means that uh, you start crossing different uh, regions of, of different uh, genes masses, which means that you have a big cloud that starts fragmenting to smaller and smaller masses, okay? So when does this fragmentation stops? Well, it stops, uh, let's say, here. And here uh, means that one of three things actually could uh, happen. One is that uh, uh, this uh, collapsing uh, cloud becomes optically thick, which means that uh, the dark photon cannot escape and therefore it cannot cool further um, because it, if it gets stuck inside, it's going to create some pressure, okay? Uh, and stabilize uh, further, uh, the, the object from further collapse. Uh, the second case is uh, if you reach the degeneracy limit, okay, if these uh, fermions become degenerate and then they cannot really, you cannot press them farther. Or if you have some Yukawa interactions, uh, these Yukawa interactions just basically forbid you to, to uh, collapse farther. Okay, so by following this, uh, this trend here, um, we found that in principle, depending on the initial conditions that one, choose, one can choose, you can get uh, dark stars or black holes uh, that can range from tens of thousands of uh, solar masses down to very, very tiny uh, dark stars or tiny black holes, depending on the conditions. Okay. Um, now, let me say a few things also about another uh, interesting possibility of uh, how you can actually see these objects. Um, these objects, um, if they exist, they can also um, accumulate interstellar protons and electrons. And in some sense, it is the um, reciprocal process of what we were studying here with neutron stars, okay? So usually we study a neutron star that, uh, that uh, you have a neutron star and then you have a dark matter particle passing by and captures the, 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 the dark matter and um, the dark matter uh, particle uh, sort of uh, thermalizes and gets stuck at the center of the, uh, uh, of the neutron star. Here's the opposite, okay? You have a dark star and you have an uh, interstellar proton or electron that goes and gets capsule within uh, this uh, dark star. So, in fact, we wanted to um, um, extend uh, the, uh, uh, the accretion rate. The accretion rate uh, has been uh, estimated by Gould uh, back in the uh, 80s in, uh, in a very seminal paper. Um, but uh, um, we, we had to take into account uh, the GR corrections. And uh, here's the, the, the full result if you just uh, take into account the uh, GR corrections. This B here is simply the part that enters here, the, uh, your, your metric. And um, it, it's in good agreement with uh, older formulas by 
basically like uh, Goldman and Nussbaum from uh, from '89. Okay, so what happens if you if you start uh, accumulating these protons and electrons within such an exotic object? Well, um, what's going to happen is that these protons and electrons are going to start uh, uh, concentrating at the center within a thermal radius, which is proportional to square root of the temperature. And uh, uh, the evolution of the evolution of this uh, object is going to be dictated by this equation here. Okay, so this is the change uh, of, of the temperature as a function of time. This is the luminosity due to the emission of Bremsstrahlung photons from this small region, okay, where protons and electrons are trapped inside. And this is the luminosity from uh, uh, dark photons, okay, and this is the heat capacity. So we assumed uh, in this particular example that uh, we had a bosonic uh, dark star. So we took the, 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 the bosonic dark star to be at the, at the BC state. So we know what is the heat capacity. And uh, then we can calculate actually what is the emissivity. There are two limits. If you are in the optically thick or the uh, uh, optically, well, thin and thick uh, limit, OK? And, um, uh, once you take this into account and you try to solve uh, this equation here, um, we found actually something interesting and kind of unexpected. Uh, we found that, um, um, well, the, the temperature actually drops uh, uh, at some point quite fast, or vice versa, the luminosity actually uh, increases and eventually has an outburst. Okay, so let me explain the physics of this because I. I I think it's quite interesting why this happens. So um, at first, uh, this uh, object okay, cools by emitting these dark photons. And uh, uh, the dark photon, we assume that has a mass. And uh, uh, when the temperature drops below the mass, basically, it cannot cool anymore by emitting these dark photons. Okay? So that's why you see the temperature basically remaining more or less constant here. However, uh, during this time, uh, the, the, the dark star is accumulating protons and electrons, okay, with a constant rate, the accumulation rate that I showed you before. And uh, this rate is, um, is proportional to, um, well, the luminosity scales like that, okay? So it's uh, proportional to the, to the uh, square of, the, uh, of, of uh, the time over the temperature. And um, as the... Uh, uh, the ordinary photons now start dominating the the, uh, the cooling of this uh, of this star by emitting energy. Um, what happens is that uh, the, as the temperature reduces, um, the thermal radius that I mentioned, where these protons and electrons are concentrated at the core of the of the dark star, reduces itself. Okay, so the more uh, you emit. Uh, the more you reduce the temperature and the, and the thermal radius reduces. And that creates this outburst. And this outburst actually cannot last forever. And it stops when actually uh, this uh, thermal sphere becomes opaque. And then you just have a black body radiation. So black body starts uh, emitting uh, photons with a luminosity that goes as t to the 5. So this is not a mistake. The t to the 5 has to do with the fact that it's the usual t to the 4, but then there is an extra t dependence in this particular problem because the, the um, thermal radius okay, of this uh, sphere is proportional to the square root of t. Okay. So that, that gives you the t to the 5 dependence. And as you can see, okay, we played around with different sort of like parameters, but uh, in principle, one can get outbursts that can last uh, from days to months. And, and they can reach, in principle, quite big values, OK? Um, now, this can be quite interesting, OK? It can be interesting because uh, um, they look like a, a point like uh, gamma ray sources. And um, not only that, but uh, also, in principle, uh, one can test, uh, for example, even dark matter decay or, or annihilation within this model. So. Assume that uh, on top of all of this, uh, dark matter particles also annihilate, okay, with some small cross-section. Well, it turns out that uh, uh, the, uh, 
I mean, this gamma ray spectrum, uh, if you have annihilation, is not going to follow um, the spectrum of uh, annihilation, which goes as the square of the density, but uh, it will just look like a decay because uh, it will just follow the profile of dark matter. So it will just scale as, uh, as the density. This is one, one thing. And the second thing is because of the fact that uh, uh, you concentrate too much dark matter in a compact object. In fact, you can uh, um, probe uh, cross sections which are super tiny, okay? Um, uh, for example, um, you, you can uh, uh, have an observable effect with cross sections uh, even at uh, the Planck scale. So something like 10 to minus 66 square centimeters, something which is completely negligible uh, if you have dark matter annihilating free. Well, within these objects, because they are so dense, uh, um, you can have a, a visible effect. So in principle, one could uh, test also Planck scale physics if this scenario goes through. All right. Um, now, let me just, uh, okay, let me just skip this. I, I, want, I, I wanted to say also a bit about 21, uh, 21 centimeter. I, let me just go to the conclusion is that uh, basically um, the presence of these dark stars could change the spectrum of the 21 centimeter. Um, um, I can explain in the break if uh, someone wants uh, to, um, how, how this happens, but uh, in principle, um, the presence of these uh, uh, objects could uh, speed up the heating, let's say, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, interstellar medium, and then instead of like going all the way down here and up, um, as you can see also uh, in this plot here, after the first galaxies form, Basically, you just go up much earlier, okay? So, so in principle, once uh, we have uh, uh, reliable data from the 21 centimeter, this actually can be tested. Um, now, let me say something along the lines that uh, Sensei mentioned before. Um, so, I'm not going to, I, I'm going to skip all this because um, uh, Sensei explained exactly what the issue is with the, with the uh, a neutron uh, anomaly decay here. Um, and let me just say the following, that uh, if one allows, for example, uh, to have this uh, decay of uh, neutrons to dark matter, uh, this is going to be a catastrophe actually, well, in some sense for neutron stars because uh, in most models, uh, by having this decay, it will allow um, neutrons to decay to dark matter and then it will completely soften the equation of state of the neutron star and simply, you, you're not going to have enough uh, uh, pressure to withhold, let's say, two solar masses. Okay, so that was the. This is the, the issue, and there were a, a bunch of papers actually on this one. Um, and people try to sort of like figure out uh, 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 how one can solve this by putting dark matter self interactions. Um, so uh, uh, this is actually the the, the model of uh, Fornal and Greenstein. Uh, from 2000, from 18, actually, that shows how this uh, neutron decay can take place. So, so this chi is the dark matter particle. Okay, phi is a, is a light mediator. So, the idea actually of uh, resolving this issue was to uh, add uh, um, a Higgs portal, add actually um, a repulsion between neutrons and dark matter. Okay, by uh, by adding a repulsion between neutrons and dark matter basically by adding uh, this term here. Um, one can actually uh, go and solve the, uh, uh, the equation of state, okay? So find where the chemical equilibrium is. So uh, what we did is like we took uh, the um, typical models from the, from the market, okay? For neutron star, um, the nuclear density and the and the pressure, etc., the equation of state, and then we added the contribution of dark matter and uh, a repulsive interaction between neutrons and dark matter, and then we uh, we uh, figure out where the equilibrium uh, holds. So um, so here is the uh, situation. Um, there are several regions here. This region here, if you are sitting here, basically your neutrons become all dark matter, okay, and your star basically collapses, okay, so there is no neutron star in this region. 
In this region here, um, there is some dark matter, um, and there is equilibrium, but uh, the uh, equation of state is so soft that it cannot get you up to two solar masses. Okay, and then um, this is the what we call the neutron phase, which is like uh, uh, basically um, you pay so much energetic cost to produce a dark matter by putting this repulsion between neutron, uh, neutrons and uh, dark matter that basically it doesn't allow you, uh, it doesn't allow you to, uh, 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 to form any dark matter, okay? And by doing that, basically, you, you save the neutron star, okay? And Greenstein model, basically, okay? Uh, but like, I, like uh, Sensei said before, um, probably this uh, discrepancy is uh, some experimental issue, but nevertheless, we, we can uh, keep uh, an eye open. So the last thing I, I, I want to mention is already uh, Joe mentioned this uh, yesterday and, uh, um, and Sanjay also today, and there is a lot of uh, important work. Uh, uh, Sanjay actually uh, in this paper here estimated uh, in, a, in a much accurate way than I and uh, Peter Tinyak of uh, estimated desermalization time uh, 10 years ago. Um, but uh, this is the scenario that we discussed where basically you accumulate uh, uh, dark matter in a neutron star and at some point the neutron star um, basically, I mean, you, have, you form a black hole and the black hole actually eats the rest of the neutron star. Now, I, 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 I just want to mention something which is uh, sometimes we just uh, forget about it and it has to do with the fact that uh, in order for this collapse to take place and uh, to set all these constraints, one has to take all the little caveats that uh, are in place. And one of them is actually the so-called bond accretion. Everybody assumes, uh, and I did also myself uh, by working on this subject, that uh, we have a spherical accretion. But uh, it turns out that, uh, in fact, uh, depending on what is the, uh, this P1 here is the uh, period of the, uh, of the neutron star. Um, depending on the period of the neutron star, you may or you may not actually uh, satisfy this, uh, uh, the condition for spherical accretion. And if you don't satisfy the condition for spherical accretion, then the problem changes because if this black hole starts accreting with a smaller rate than what we assume it does, uh, well, it, uh, it might evaporate, that's one thing, uh, or it, uh, actually it might uh, accrete so uh, slowly that uh, it might be there, but it might not have enough time to destroy the star, okay? So this in principle has to be taken into account. Uh, one thing that can save actually the spherical accretion is uh, to uh, take into consideration um, the uh, viscosity, okay? Because uh, what happens when you have viscosity is that uh, basically um, the star, um, takes uh, viscosity, actually takes angular momentum from the inside and moves it outwards. And therefore, this is helpful for the black hole because the black hole actually can grow uh, at the beginning uh, when uh, it's small and it cannot take a lot of uh, angular momentum. And eventually, when it grows big and it can take as much as uh, we want, then it can uh, eat up the rest of the star, okay? So, um, however, we, uh, we worked on this and we found that uh, uh, the, um, um, we don't really know very well actually what is the viscosity uh, inside the, the core of the neutron star also because we don't really know exactly what happens at the core of the neutron star. Okay, so uh, I think I went over, uh, I am over time, so, so I will just skip the, the last figure, okay, uh, and, uh, and just flash my conclusions here. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for a nice talk. We have time for questions. Please, up there. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, so can, can you go to uh, your slide on dark star outbursts? Yeah. Uh, where do you... Uh, yes. So on the left plot, uh, as we change the mass of the photon from 10 GeV to like say 100 GeV, why these uh, curvature changes? I mean, from the black to the purple one? Yeah. 
uh, why the why the change of curvature? I mean, what is the f I mean, how to understand it from a physical perspective as we change? Oh, that, that, that has to do with the fact that uh, basically uh, the star uh, cools by emitting uh, dark photons. Okay, so if you have a different mass, basically, um, you know, you feel a different exponential tail um, as the as the as the uh, star cools down. So so I mean. The fact that you have uh, uh, that your dark photon has a mass means that uh, there is some exponential suppression actually in the emission of this, right? So by changing the uh, mass, you just change this exponential tail. So what you see is a different uh, uh, exponential tail here. Okay. Other questions? So with respect to this figure and dark stars, how do you know that the protons that you accrete uh, can burn s stably or unstably under these conditions? Can you have explosive nuclear reactions at these high temperatures? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Since I, I mean, uh, we, we have to start thinking about this, actually. Uh, so f you mean basically like fusing, right? right? Absolutely. Yeah. If I yeah. look at the temperatures there, uh, you know, they're much hotter than the sun, and at some point, yeah. you're just going to get rid of all your protons, maybe explosively because of the gravity. Yeah, it's it's um, um, it's a bit complicated actually. I mean, we, we started thinking about this, uh, but um, uh, because in principle, in order to do that properly, in some sense, you have to solve this. You have to solve. Uh, it's like a mini sun, let's say, right? But um, embedded within the potential. Of, of the of the dark star so so we haven't done that yet yeah, yeah. other questions uh, so if we accept that about 25 percent of the universe is made of dar uh, dark matter then naively <coughs> thinking I would guess that dark stars also should be quite abundant so it means that uh, dark star, dark star mergers uh, would, uh, would be quite, quite frequent, right? And as so, then we would see a lot of something which is like a usual neutron star merger, but without non-gravitational counterpart. But so far, we never observed that. Doesn't it exclude uh, dark stars? Yeah. Um, well, the brief answer is no, uh, because for, for the following reason, I mean, this is something that I didn't mention, which is like uh, in this scenario of, uh, of for formation that I mentioned, okay, you need uh, strong enough self-interactions, okay, uh, in order to make it collapse uh, fast enough. And um, um, one has to take into account the fact that uh, uh, dark matter, th there are some constraints from the bullet cluster, etc., and therefore, um, it can be only a small component of dark matter that can have self uh, strong self interactions. Okay, something like 10% or even 5%. So, depends on uh, who you ask. Um, and then, so if let's say this is a, a, a strongly interacting component of dark matter, which is like 5%, and then uh, if we take the analog from sort of uh, ordinary star formation that. Uh, half of the population is in uh, gas and the other half is in, uh, in stars. That makes it about 2.5%. Uh, uh, so from this point of view, no, I don't think you can exclude it. Okay, so just because they are, uh, the metal also, also, just to say this, also because uh, it's not clear what is the mass also, right? I mean, depending on the, on the underlying dark matter mass, uh, I mean, if this object is, uh, is uh, let's say, less than one solar mass, uh, you just you get out of the uh, out of reach, right? Okay. I'm going to ask another question. These stars are formed before ordinary stars are formed. D yeah. So, <coughs> if they precede star formation. Well, uh, yeah, go ahead, yeah, so. sorry. Can, can they actually seed? Because now they become gravitational centers for ba ordinary baryonic matter. So could, could it be that 
you make these stars and then they see the regular star formation all of them end up inside regular stars yeah so so basically in, in uh, when we studied this for uh, for this 21 centimeter that i didn't mention i didn't say that much um basically we took uh, the uh, the typical sort of like hello models like uh per sector and um you know in these models you just assume that uh, once you you decouple from the expansion you just collapse okay so from this point of view uh, these stars do not form let's say earlier than the population three stars okay i mean they, they form in the, and that's why the spectrum that i showed uh, uh, if you if you see here um it's uh, sort of like a, you know, it's the same kind of like uh, turnaround here. Okay, it, it doesn't move to the to the right. Basically, uh, if they would form earlier, you would see this moving moving to the right. So um, we haven't thought about this. I mean, but the point is that uh, I, I think to make them uh, collapse uh, earlier, uh, you have to implement some long range forces. I mean, I know that there's work by Kusenko and. Uh, and uh, his collaborators, that they work on, on sort of like a, a long range forces uh, between dark matter, which can uh, act like a, a, a strong gravity only for dark matter, that can uh, make things collapse for dark matter earlier than, than ordinary matter. But that, that's not it. I had a similar question, yeah, about the pop three stars. Like we have some candidates for the for pop three star, whether we can basically probe these uh, proto-clouds and collapse to the stars. Yeah. I think there's been more <coughs> candidates for, for POPs 3 star, we could say Yeah, something. well, this is, I mean, I, I don't think this qualifies as a, as a population 3 star because uh, this is, I mean, these are sort of like objects that have a tiny core of, uh, of protons and electrons, I, I mean, within uh, our model. So I don't think they qualify. It, it's just that they, I mean, in this setup, they help uh, speeding up the, the heating of the uh, of the medium, so that's why you see, for example, here that uh, instead of like going all the way down, you know, it just heats up quite fast, actually starts going up again. Unfortunately, we don't have more time for questions. Please ask during the coffee break. We have to move on. Let's send speaker again.